We saw the story in Las Vegas tonight. Kim, the challenger, was fighting champion Ray Mancini. For 13 rounds, it was what some observers called a war. Imagine you've got a pickup basketball game going on on a street corner. A bunch of people are watching. And then on the other street corner, a fight breaks out. People are going to stop watching the basketball game, and they're going to watch the fight. There's something fundamental and primal about boxing. But as society shifts, there are legitimate questions of, well, do we still want to do this? Kim is still down. He is being taken out on a stretcher, evidently, taking him uh, to a nearby hospital. It's that drip, 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 that constant sense that that is what boxing is about. If that becomes a prevailing feeling about football, then the discussion changes. In the old days, you might turn on a television on a weekend afternoon, and three networks have, have a boxing match. In 82 particularly, there was an NFL strike, and figuring NFL fans are going to want to see action sports, we replaced it with boxing. Mancini is enjoying being a world champion. In May of that year, Ray Boom Boom Mancini, the pride of Youngstown, Ohio, had won his first world lightweight championship. No, I worked so hard to get it, I'm not about to give it up now. Ray Mancini was a very, very popular champion. His whole persona was of being this just nice kid from Ohio. The ratings for Mancini fights were great, our highest ratings of any fighter we were doing. On November 13th, 1982, in a Las Vegas stadium before a live CBS audience, Mancini was set to defend his title against a little-known Korean challenger. Fighting, Fighting out of Seoul, Korea. Korea. Weighing 134 and one quarter pounds, there is Duke Ku Kim. We had never heard of Duke Ku Kim before that, but we would look at film, videotape, whatever we could get of him fighting, and we knew he was a very tough guy. We didn't want a guy who was going to run. We wanted somebody who would stand there and, and exchange, and that was Kim's style. And there's the bell, and we are underway. In the Kim built a um, coffin, and he put it next to his bed, and he told his people, either Mancini's coming home in that or I'm going home in that. Put on the lampshade, kill or be killed. To him, it was a, a live or die situation. It was a brutal fight. In fact, Kim was the aggressor more than Ray for most of the fight, but there was never a point where you thought one guy was beating the other guy to the point where a referee should have stopped him. Duke Kim, you may not have heard of him before. You will remember him today, win or lose. I was hitting him with shots, but he was still moving, making me miss, too. He still had the wherewithal to move his body, make, slip, bob, and weave. You can't stop a fight when a guy has the wherewithal to do that. It was a great punch. I hit him with the right shot. He went down. We just jumped. It was glorious because it was a great win. Nobody knows about the ramp, you know, what, what was going into it. Nobody knew. I planned on a long fight. Everybody didn't know about it. I saw it filmed. The guy was very, very impressive. Tough, rough, hungry, right, determined. Right. Those are the worst kind. The next morning, I called and said, what's going on? And he was still in the hospital and in bad shape. And, and then it was pretty much we all knew what was going to happen. You know, he wasn't coming out of this. I was stunned. I was like in a dream world, you know, from the highest to the highest to hit the lowest of the lows. A professional boxer lies near death tonight. He is Juk Koo Kim, a 23-year-old South Korean lightweight. The boxer's mother pleading with him to please wake up and open eyes before she was led from the room weeping. When you fight fighters from another country, they're fighting for more than themselves, they're fighting for their whole country. They carry no dreams and hopes of their countrymen on their backs. That's, that's a load to fight. That's a hard load to fight. Kim's death was far from boxing's first fatality in the ring. In the early 60s, fighters Benny Perrette and Davey Moore died in back-to-back -back years after major fights on national television. At that point, there was a sense of, wow, is boxing even really a sport? In the mid-70s, you have the sense of impropriety that has been an aspect of boxing's DNA for many decades. And then in 82, you had Ray Mancini and Duku Kim. And then two weeks later, I'm watching, and there's this fight with uh, Randall Tex Cobb and Larry Holmes. It's just terrible. I wonder if that referee understands 
that he is constructing an advertisement for the abolition of the very sport that he's a part of. Cobb was a punching bag. I mean, his head was just bobbing back and forth on and on and on. From the point of view of boxing, which is under fire, and deservedly so, this fight could not have come at a worse time. And I just said to myself, this is crazy. How can I, as a physician, possibly admire this, enhance it, support it, and not work against it? Boxing attracts big television audiences. It has drawn the attention of writers from Virgil to Hemingway to Norman Mailer. But today, the American Medical Association came out swinging against the sport. The AMA Journal says that boxing is an obscenity that should not be sanctioned by any civilized society. The purpose of the boxing match is for one person to injure his or her opponent. Now, when one knocks somebody out, one damages the brain, one tears brain cells. I don't think fight fans said, OK, that's it, I'm never going to watch another fight, just as they didn't say, OK, I'm never going to smoke another cigarette when, when they put a warning on the, on the pack. Um, but, but sponsors started to, to pull back and say, you know, you're asking us for a lot of money, you networks, to pay for your exorbitant rights fees on football and basketball and baseball. And with all the bad publicity boxing is getting, you know what, we just as soon not do it. Before the Kim fight, I was being offered all kind of endorsement deals. After that, everything went away, man. It just vanished. I understand that now. I understand now. But at the time, I was a kid. I was, I was heartbroken. I, I, I didn't know why, you know. It just it all went away. For decades, stories of young boxers from blue-collar backgrounds fighting their way to fortune had captivated the public, both in real life... I do it because I, I leave. I leave the ghettos. ...and on the big screen. The American Medical Association... But before long, the medical community began to make inroads in their fight against the sport. The American Academy of Pediatrics uh, came out with a formal position that children shouldn't box. I took a position that for any parent who put their child into a boxing situation, that should be considered child abuse. And on television, beer companies were soon the only marquee advertisers still associated with boxing. The WBC Heavyweight Championship fight is being brought to you by Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. Sponsors withdraw, so network TV doesn't want to broadcast it. So people don't see as much boxing, so they don't know as much about it. So sporting media doesn't write about it as much because they say people don't watch boxing, they're not interested in it. And because media isn't reporting on it, people learn about it even less. And it becomes this feedback thing, and before you know it, suddenly it's a niche sport. The legendary Julio Cesar Chavez returns to the ring Saturday, October 12th on pay-per-view. There's absolutely an undercurrent in sports spectatorship, which is about they like the, in, the intrinsic violence of this. You're going there to live out some sort of spectator fantasy. Somehow MMA over time has sort of taken the place of boxing. In the NFL, it's almost like a fight every play, and the plays happen over and over, quick, 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 quick. People like that. Keeps their attention. So there was a guy called Bert Sugar, an old boxing historian. And he said to me a while back, he goes, I submit to you that the best American heavyweight right now is Ray Lewis. Guys who are 200 and something pounds, six foot four, six foot five, were no longer seeing boxing as the opportunity for them. They could go into football and they could earn a lot more money at a lot less risk. That perception of football is starting to change. This half hour, NFL great Junior Seau has apparently committed suicide. Sadly, he's not the first NFL star to take his own life. Meantime, more players are suing the NFL, claiming the league failed to properly protect them from concussions Houston and brain injuries during their careers. Look, at this point, we know how dangerous football is. Anyone who continues to believe that professional football players aren't potentially shortening their lifespan by playing this game is sort of living on another planet. In a surprise announcement, star 49ers linebacker Chris Borland says he's retiring from the NFL. The San Francisco 49er is walking away from it all today, concerned about brain injury in the future. Around training camp, there was an incident, just a mild concussion, and it kind of changed the way I viewed the risks of the game. The mounting evidence and these anecdotes of guys 
who went through hell. By the end of the year, I had a good idea of what I was going to do. For 99.9% .9 of people in America, football is just entertainment and theater. but these guys on the field are real. Um, they're humans, and so um, I think it's important to remember that. The NFL has a big issue in the concussion, the head injury situation, huge issue. But there is an entity called the National Football League. There's a controlling entity, there's a managing entity. Football has the NFL to solve its problems, or to at least attempt to solve its problems. It has a PR machine to tell the public that we're working on this. Boxing was controlled by promoters and the networks back in the day. So there was no such thing as boxing. It had no ability to defend itself because there's no organization. And that might have been one of the biggest problems they had. Today, the organization behind football has more money and power than any sport in American history. You now make about 10 billion dollars a year in gross revenue. You said that by 2027, you would like to see 25 billion we don't want to become complacent. Meanwhile, the dark side of football is hitting home on local fields across the country. Smith is the seventh high school football player to die this season, either during or immediately after a game. And we're only halfway through. I hear from young kids who love football and want to play football. And they do ask me questions of, should I play? If white suburban households stop allowing their kids to play football, is football going to die? And the answer is absolutely not. There is a, certainly a double standard. I mean, if you support football in the sense that you watch it and then turn around and don't allow your child to play it, the question is kind of like, by watching it, are you necessarily condoning it? It's so ingrained in our culture that it does take a kind of real act of protest and resistance to turn away from it. Three decades since the Kim Mancini fight stoked medical concerns about boxing, football doesn't appear to be slowing down. More people watched the Super Bowl in 2015 than any show in U.S. television history. If somebody were to die during an NFL game, being broadcast live, the massive social media response, would that cause a greater, perhaps long-term response? Or would it mean that everyone went through the cycle of grief and outrage in a couple of days until Kim Kardashian did something else? I don't know. The concussion issue has been pretty serious, and there's been a lot of conversation about it. And football viewership figures keep going up. 